terrorist attack here in Lower Manhattan. As we have been reporting, a man driving a rented pickup truck drove onto a bike path here and mowed down pedestrians and bikers. Eight people were killed in that attack. Eleven were seriously injured. The driver is said to be a 29-year-old immigrant from Uzbekistan. He was shot by police and taken into custody. He's now hospitalized. We've reported this morning that a note found in his truck said, quote, ISIS lives forever. That's a translation. The attack unfolded just about 20 hours ago. The driver drove to New York City from New Jersey, then down the west side of Manhattan, entering the bike path and traveling almost a mile. I want to go straight to the presser uh, by New York City officials. Let's listen in. After the fire commissioner, Chief Gomez, John Miller, come in. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel. We're seeing an array of New York City officials getting the press organized and themselves organized. They're about to brief uh, members of the public. I see the governor of New York, the commissioner of police here in New York City, as well as uh, other officials, counterterrorism officials. Good morning, everyone. Uh, regarding our joint NYPD FBI investigation into yesterday's truck terror attack on the west side of Lower Manhattan, today we're going to give you a, an update on some of the things we've learned overnight. We're going to get an update on the uh, injured from uh, FDNY Commissioner Dan Nigro. Then you'll hear from Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo. And I want to thank for being here at Manhattan District uh, Attorney Cy Vance, June Kim, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Commissioner Roger Perino is here from New York State Homeland Security. And then uh, Joe Esposito from OEM, the Commissioner of OEM, is here also. Also, like to thank the state police for being here today and for everything they did yesterday. Chief of the Department Carlos Goes, Gomez is going to lay out some of the security plans we have in play, place in light of yesterday's event and ahead of Sunday's New York City Marathon. And it'll also give you an update on the traffic situation on the west side. Uh, Bill Sweeney, the Assistant Director in Charge of the New York Office of the FBI, will make a statement. And then uh, John Miller, Deputy Commissioner of Intel and Counterterrorism, will share with you some of the details about th the work that we're doing on this case. And you have to understand that uh, this investigation is still in its infancy. We do not yet have all the answers. And there are details today, and there'll be more down the road, and uh, not everything we're going to be able to share with you. You understand that? You know, in terms of casualties, this is the worst terror attack in New York City since September 11, 2011. I want to take a minute to commend all New Yorkers. I want to commend everyone who lives in, works in, and visits our great city, because no one in this city is complacent. We saw the strength of that resolve last night with the very large crowds that attended the annual, the annual Halloween parade in the village. And we'll see it again on Sunday when 50,000 people compete in a marathon and another 2.5 million people cheer, cheer them along the route. The NYPD. The FBI and all of our law enforcement and private sector partners remembers our past. And we work very, very hard together each and every day to prevent the type of thing that occurred here yesterday. What happened yesterday was not okay. It will never be something any of us will just accept as inevitable. Since 9-11, we, again along with our partners at the local, state, and federal level, have disrupted or prevented two dozen plots against New York City. Countless lives have been saved. But none of that matters when eight innocent lives are taken by a criminal committing a cowardly act driving a rental truck. We are working hard to get to the bottom of exactly what happened yesterday and why. And we're working tirelessly to prevent anything like this from getting repeated. I tell you as often as I can that true public safety is a shared responsibility. Law enforcement, government agencies are doing what we can. And the men and women who work with us do it better than anyone anywhere in the world. But we need everyone's help. There are more than 8.5 million people in New York City, plus all the people who commute in every day and all the tourists. That's a minimum of 17 million extra eyes and ears and gut feelings that can remain vigilant on behalf of all of us. And I talk about this all the time. If you see something out there that doesn't look right, if it makes you uncomfortable, you have an obligation to make a call or to flag down a police car. At least give us the opportunity to investigate that. I want to thank everyone for their ongoing help today and every day. 
And thank you again for the swift response yesterday by the NYPD officers, the New York State Police, the firefighters, and EMS workers who did a really great job under the circumstances. And right now, let me introduce uh, FDNY Commissioner Dan Nigro. Dan's going to give you an update on the injuries from yesterday. Dan? Thank you. And I'm going to be uh, very nonspecific regarding uh, the privacy of the victims. There were 20 victims to yes at yesterday's attack. Six of them were pronounced dead at the scene. We transported 14 victims to three hospitals. Two of those victims were pronounced. So the total number of deaths were eight. Six of those were citizens of uh, other countries, five from Argentina, one from Germany, two were Americans. Of the 12 remaining, thankfully, three have been released from the hospital. Nine remain in the hospital. Four of those were critically injured but are in stable condition. The others are seriously injured. The injuries ranged from a bilateral amputation to serious head, neck, back, and chest trauma and trauma to arms and legs. Um, this was a, a heinous attack that resulted in eight deaths and serious injuries. Our prayers are with the families of those who died and those who remain in the hospital. Thank you, Commissioner Nigro, and thank you to all the men and women of the FDNY, all the first responders, all the EMTs who went to the aid of those who were afflicted and did it so well. I want to start by thanking all of my colleagues who are here. Thank you, Governor Cuomo, and all of our state partners who are here, all of our federal partners. Thank you, Congressman Jerry Nadler, for joining us. Everyone's here in common cause. This was an attack on the United States of America, an attack on New York City, an attack on our people. And it was the definition of terrorism, an effort to take away people's hope and spirit and to make them change. And what New Yorkers showed already is we will not change. We will not be cowed. We will not be thrown off by anything. And this cowardly act targeting the most innocent people in the middle of the most innocent pursuits was meant to make people feel they could not go about their daily lives. And what we saw last night, Governor Cuomo and I went to our annual Halloween parade. A million New Yorkers showed up for that event. And as we spoke with them, uh, they were undeterred. They were strong. It made me very proud of New York City and all the people of this country to see that strength in the face of adversity. This morning, people went to work. Kids went to school. No one thought there was any choice but to stand up to this act of terror. So as we now move forward, we start with giving our prayers to the families of the eight who were killed. They, as you heard, uh, six of them came from other nations here because they saw New York as a special place to be. And we now and forever will consider them New Yorkers. They shared this tragedy with us. We will remember them as New Yorkers. They were here because this city is a, a beacon to people all over the world, a place that every kind of person comes to and is respected. And that won't change. Eight and a half million people here. We understand this was an attack on our values. It was an effort to break our spirit. But as an effort to break our spirit, it failed. New York City is a very strong and resilient place. We have great faith in the men and women who protect us. We have such pride in the NYPD. And we see them on duty, and we know they are the very best. So we're strong, we're resilient people, because we know we're protected, and we know that this place works when people don't feel deterred. And I'll tell you, this violence was an effort to make us blink, and we won't blink. We won't change. The NYPD yesterday showed us once again how much New Yorkers can rely on them, and I want to commend 
Officer Ryan Nash. I spoke to him earlier today. A good young man, five years on the force. He was very humble about what he did, but what he did was extraordinary and gave people such faith and such appreciation in our police force. Now, this investigation, as you've heard, has just begun. It's important to emphasize again this morning that we do not see any additional uh, credible and specific threats against New York City. We will constantly keep people posted. But we do ask everyone to be vigilant. Commissioner O'Neill laid out what everyone has to understand. Be a part of the solution. Share what you know with the police. Don't think twice. Give information to our officers. And many of those previous efforts to undermine us, the commissioner referenced those almost two dozen previous efforts to attack New York City. A number of them were stopped because good people came forward with information in time. We need everyone to understand that they can do that too. As we move forward, we will look forward to the marathon on Sunday. It will go on as scheduled. It will be an extraordinary event as it always is. It will be well protected as it always is, and we will take additional measures to ensure that. But my message to all New Yorkers is do what you do best. Be New Yorkers. Be strong. Be proud. Be resilient. Show the whole world right now that we will not be moved by terror. Again, you see everyone here, every agency united in common cause. And this is also part of what makes us strong. And with that, I want to thank for his efforts and the state's efforts and welcome Governor Cuomo. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by asking us all to remember in our thoughts and prayers the eight lives uh, that were lost tragically. Uh, that, that is damage that can never be undone, and there are families today feeling pain uh, that is unimaginable. Uh, Mayor de Blasio, to the NYPD, the FDNY, the state police, uh, I was on the scene yesterday. The performance was uh, phenomenal. And the coordination and the effort uh, was top shelf. And uh, it gives one reassurance to know that there is this level of professionalism and expertise protecting the people of this city uh, and this state. Uh, it's also too uh, important to remember that uh, while the leadership of the police departments is uh, top shelf, uh, Officer Nash, five years on the job, 28 years old, he was a hero. And uh, the NYPD is not just the leadership, it's the men and women who are out there every day, uh, who are on the first line. And I think Officer Nash uh, really showed how important they are uh, and how talented and how brave. So we all applaud and congratulate him. I spoke to the uh, Homeland Security Secretary uh, yesterday, who pledges full coordination with all the federal efforts uh, and the FBI. I think it's important that we are all working as one, and uh, in this kind of situation there is no alternative. This is not a time to have politics. This is not a time to uh, point fingers. This is not a time to find blame. It's a time to come together. Uh, and work for a common goal. The effort yesterday uh, killed eight people. Uh, but in my opinion, the effort failed because the effort was not uh, to kill eight people. The effort was to disrupt us, to terrorize us, to scare us, uh, to create mayhem. That's the effort. That's the goal on all of these attacks. Uh, New York is a special target because we have that Statue of Liberty in our harbor that we're proud of, holding up the torch for freedom and democracy. But we've seen it all around the world. 
and it is to create mayhem and terrorize. And it failed. The mayor is exactly right. The Halloween parade last night was a beautiful example of the failure of the attempt. A million New Yorkers came out with their families, with their children. They celebrated. They were there uh, just a number of hours after the incident. And it was New York's way of saying, we will not be deterred. We are not terrorized. You will not win. We said that in 1993, after the World Trade Center bombing the first time. We said that after 9-11. And we said that yesterday, unprompted, spontaneously. They were all there. And uh, the mayor and I marched. And it was really reassuring to see the resilience of New Yorkers. Now, you'll see increased police presence uh, all across the metropolitan area. We are going to double the number of bodies at places of congregation, uh, airports, tunnels, uh, Penn Station, which has 600,000 people that go through it every day, the most heavily traveled transportation hub in the hemisphere. I don't want anyone to draw any inference from that. We don't know anything. Uh, we're not responding to anything. It's just uh, as a precaution. Same thing at the marathon. The marathon will go on uh, because New York goes on, and it's an important event for all of New Yorkers. Uh, again, I want to end where I started. The effort by the first responders was phenomenal. The reaction by New Yorkers, as evidenced last night, this morning, People got up, they went to work, children went to school, and that's what makes New Yorkers special. That strength, that resilience, that ability to be undeterred uh, in the face of ugliness uh, and the actions of a depraved coward, because that's what this was. This was the actions of a depraved coward. Uh, there is no grand statement to what was done. Uh, it was the act of a coward. Uh, and that's, that's the way it should be regarded, because that's the way it was. I was proud to be the governor of the state of New York last night. Uh, I'm proud every day, but seeing New Yorkers' response uh, made me feel especially proud. And again, to the team you see assembled up here, the FBI, the NYPD, FDNY, uh, the seamless coordination uh, really is, is something to behold and a source of strength and comfort, I hope, for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thanks, Governor. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And just uh, to reiterate what the Governor and, and the Mayor said, now's the time, not the time to live in fear. It's not the time to be fearful. Now's the time for all New Yorkers to be strong, as we always are. Right now, uh, Chief Carlos Gomez, he's our Chief of Department, he's going to talk about what we're doing to uh, increase security throughout the city. Carlos. All right, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, immediately following yesterday's attack in uh, Lower Manhattan, uh, the department uh, quickly mobilized and deployed additional resources, uh, additional police officers, and additional heavy weapons teams to key locations uh, throughout the city. Uh, last night's Halloween parade, which uh, attracted uh, um, over a million uh, participants, was also security at that parade was also enhanced. We added more sand trucks, we added more block of vehicles to the uh, side streets that led on to Sixth Avenue, and we also assigned more heavy weapons teams, not just to the parade, but to the uh, the surrounding. Um, area. Uh, New Yorkers and others who utilize our transit system will see, will see a lot more offices. They'll see a lot more uniforms. They'll see more offices on the trains. Uh, they will see more offices on the platforms. Uh, they should expect more bag checks at, at more stations. Uh, we, they will be uh, more canines, uh, explosive detecting canines in, in our subway system and heavy weapons teams from our strategic response group as well as our critical response command will also be deployed to major hubs and other stations uh, throughout the city. Uh, there are some tra uh, traffic closures that remain in effect and I'd like to, uh, to point out that is the West Side Highway from 14th Street down to the, uh, the tunnel. 
it still remains an active uh, crime scene and we anticipate it, it will be closed until uh, early this evening. So we've assigned traffic agents to the area, but motorists, please avoid that, uh, that area. And we're just a few days away from the New York City uh, Marathon, which uh, uh, 51, over, 50, over 51,000 runners will participate. As the commission has said, uh, two and a half million spectators will line the streets um, in, in, all the, um, in all the boroughs in our city, and we've enhanced, we've enhanced the security for this also. It's gonna be a very safe event. We've added uh, more sand trucks, uh, more blocker vehicles. I, I can't give you the, the exact number. I mean, I do have it, I can't give it to you, but it will be the most ever deployed at, uh, at this event. Uh, we more than doubled our uh, observation teams, our rooftop observation posts, as well as our counter sniper teams from the emergency services unit throughout the boroughs, not just here in, um, in Manhattan. And we've also added uh, more heavy weapons teams throughout the city, officers from our emergency services unit, from our strategic response group, and from our critical uh, res response command. They'll be at fixed locations along the route, but they will also have a uh, mobile response capability if they are needed uh, els elsewhere. And uh, this increase will supplement the already large, substantial detail of uniform officers that you'll see along the route. Uh, but there will also be officers attired in civilian attire and plain clothes that you won't see. They'll be mixing in with the crowds uh, to detect any suspicious uh, activity. Uh, canines, uh, a large number of canines will be deployed along the route as well counterterrorism officers with their resources and, and equipment. Uh, our aviation helicopters will, uh, will patrol from above. They'll survey rooftops as well as the, um, as the route. And certainly uh, traffic control agents, they'll have the, uh, the, the hard task of, uh, of keeping traffic moving in the, in the affected um, um, areas. Um, <clears throat> as the commissioner said, uh, eight and a half million New Yorkers, uh, several million other tourists, that's a lot of eyes and ears in, in our city. If you see something, say something, tell an officer, call 911, uh, or certainly you could call the New York City Terrorism Hotline, 888-NYC SAFE. And we look for it to be a very safe and enjoyable Sunday. Thank you. All right, thanks, Carlos. And now we're gonna hear from Bill Sweeney, the Assistant Director in Charge of the New York FBI Office. Uh, Bill and his people continue to be great partners in New York City. Bill. Thank you, Jimmy. Good morning, everybody. Our thoughts and prayers uh, from the Bureau are with all the victims' families, uh, especially this morning, and for all those that are still recovering. Right now, the New York JTTF, which is comprised of about 50-plus agencies, is following up on related leads as we work to process and analyze intelligence information related to yesterday's attack. Like last year, our partner JTTF in Newark is also fully engaged. Both of those JTTFs, both here in New York and in Newark, are operating 24-7 and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. We also have joint terrorism task forces around the country that are following up on leads as we generate them and kick those out. The investigation is still in its early stages. I know I say this each time, but it is vitally important that we do not inadvertently disclose information that could adversely impact this investigation. I think the public understands that need for the level of operational security and for that reason, I may not be able to answer specific questions on how much or what we know. I can say we've been conducting searches throughout the night and into this morning. I expect those searches will continue and additional searches will develop as we generate additional information. I expect evidence collection on the scene to continue till at least early this afternoon, but more likely till early this evening. We are very grateful for the patience and the resiliency of the workers and the people that reside in the Tribeca area. I'm asking the public to call us with any information that you may have. We've set up a hotline. The two numbers are on the, on the chart to your left. The first, nationwide, 1-800-CALL-FBI. Obviously, the NYPD number is up there as well. But we have a second site, which is vitally important. It is a link where the public can upload their videos and their photographs that they may have obtained when they were down at the scene. That link is fbi.gov backslash NYC Tribeca. That allows the public to upload those videos uh, so we can review them for additional evidence. Thank you for uh, your cooperation. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, thanks, Bill. And uh, now John Miller is gonna give us uh, an updated chronology 
what happened yesterday, and he's also going to talk a little bit about the investigation. And again, uh, what uh, Bill said, I know you're going to have a lot of questions, but uh, we, have to, we have to let this investigation uh, get more mature. It's not even 24 hours yet. There's going to be some things we can tell you, and there's going to be a lot of things that we can tell you. So, John? Thanks, Commissioner. Just to reiterate, we are in the early stages of this investigation, so the information I'm going to give you today remains preliminary, meaning some details, timelines, et cetera, may change as we develop more granular information. This investigation is being carried out jointly by the NYPD-FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force um, and the Intelligence Bureau of the NYPD with the Counterterrorism Bureau and um, hundreds of detectives from the NYPD Detective Bureau who responded to the scene and worked through the night um, developing evidence and following leads. The timeline as we have it now starts at 2.06 p.m., at which point the suspect rents a uh, large vehicle from the Home Depot located in Passaic, New Jersey. According to license plate readers on the George Washington Bridge, he exits the bridge into New York City, uh, southbound on the West Side Highway at 2.43 p.m. At 3.04, a Port Authority camera on top of an air vent outside the Holland Tunnel shows the vehicle entering the bike lane and traveling at a high rate of speed southbound at West Street and Houston Street. At this point, according to witnesses, video, and investigation, he appears to target bicycle riders and pedestrians within the southbound bike lane traveling at a high rate of speed. That ends when he collides with the school bus, um, injuring a number of additional people. And at 3.08 p.m., we get uh, more than a dozen 911 calls reporting people down, uh, the school bus accident, and a man with a gun in the street. Two First Precinct police officers who were out on another call are alerted by civilians about the activity going on outside. They leave that location. They're joined by a third officer. They observe a man who appears to be waving a gun and yelling um, at the scene of the accident, and they observe people down on the scene. One of those officers, Brian Nash, um, takes action and fires his service weapon, bringing the attack to an end. As the, injures, as the injured were being removed um, by fire department and EMS personnel um, and being triaged at the scene, a perimeter was set up around that truck and the NYPD bomb squad was called in to clear that vehicle for any suspicious devices. The suspect is identified as Seifulo Sepov, a 29-year-old legal permanent resident of the United States who came into the country from Uzbekistan in March of 2010. Overnight, uh, based on the investigation, uh, there have been a number of search warrants executed, um, and there may be more. Witnesses interviewed, um, associates tracked down, and, and other activity. We've been able to piece together um, a number of facts. Recovered in and around the vehicle were multiple knives, the two imitation pistols, one a paintball gun, the other a Crossman pellet gun. As you know, there are eight dead and 12 injured. Uh, we have a lot to go through. Uh, the Detective Bureau in particular, um, using hundreds of detectives, has been going up and down uh, the West Side Highway on both sides of the street, meticulously trying to pick up every piece of video from every security camera, every traffic camera, um, every bank camera, anything that will help us put together this timeline and have the imagery to go with it so we can reconstruct as much of this as possible. We'll also be reviewing uh, license plate reader data, not just our own, but from the surrounding area to help reconstruct the suspect's movement over the preceding days, as well as interviews uh, with associates. The suspect was transported to Bellevue Hospital. Um, we are awaiting to hear um, an update on his condition today. Obviously, he is in custody and under arrest. Based on the investigation overnight, it appears that Mr. Sapov had been planning this for a number of weeks. He did this in the name of ISIS um, and along with the other items recovered at the scene was um, some notes that further indicate that. 
He appears to have followed um, almost exactly to a T the instructions that ISIS has put out in its social media channels before with instructions to their followers on how to carry out such an attack. Uh, at this point, we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I know, I know the mayor talked about this yesterday, and uh, it, it's a big city. You know, I know the bike path very well. I don't think there are any bollards there at Houston Street or at Chambers Street. So, of course, uh, we're going to take a look at that now. I said yesterday that we learned from, from every event, not just in this city, but across the world. Yeah. Have you had a chance to talk to the suspect? What uh, Bill or John? Uh, suspect was interviewed um, at the hospital and we're not going to be able to go into his statements in any specificity. This side? Yeah, right there. I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Miller talk about that. John, you want to answer that first? Sure. Uh, what we can say is Mr. Seipoff has never been the subject of an NYPD Intelligence Bureau investigation, nor has he been the subject of an FBI investigation, and we know that through our work with the JTTF um, and, and Bill Overnight. Uh, what we are looking for is uh, how has he touched uh, the subjects of other investigations? What is his connectivity to those people? And we're kind of building out in concentric circles to try and document that. But it appears he will have can he will have some connectivity to individuals who were the subjects of investigation, though he himself was not. Uh, I received calls uh, yesterday from the Homeland Security Secretary and from the Homeland Security Advisor in the White House. Uh, Mr. Bossert, and uh, both offered uh, any and all help uh, to New York City in this moment uh, and said they would be 100 percent available to us in any way going forward. So those calls happened, uh, give or take, 7 o'clock uh, yesterday evening. Not from the President directly, no. Uh, I received no call from the President. Uh, I also uh, received a call from the Homeland Security uh, Secretary, Acting Secretary uh, Duke, uh, and we spoke about coordination of resources, uh, JTTF, uh, FBI, uh, but uh, basically, uh, did we need any other assistance from the federal government? I actually received a phone call from the Acting Secretary also, a little bit after 8. Yep, David. Look, I'm not bothered at all uh, because uh, two senior officials called promptly and offered help, and I think that was appropriate. I think we are we are here to talk about uh, this situation, the facts, and uh, no one up here wants to politicize any of this, and I don't think anyone should be politicizing this uh, this tragedy at this moment in time. I think every focus should be on those uh, whose lives were lost, on their families. Uh, on the work we have to do in this investigation. We've been listening to the briefing going on at New York City Police Headquarters from a number of officials, including the governor of New York, the mayor of New York, the police commissioner, and we've learned a few more details about this attack that unfolded yesterday afternoon, including that the suspect here appeared, according to officials, to be planning this for several weeks. We know that he rented this truck, this Home Depot truck, this weapon of destruction, at 2.06 yesterday afternoon and one hour later was going down fast at a high rate of speed, mowing over civilians, pedestrians, cyclists, and killing eight people. Let me get to NBC's Pete Williams, who's been listening in this afternoon. Pete, more, what more could you add? Well, in addition to the note found at the truck about ISIS lives forever, officials say that they know he was consuming ISIS propaganda online 
looking at this ISIS material and have begun doing so, they say recently, they can't be more specific than that. And they say that he appears to be radicalized on his own. They don't know of anyone in the United States or overseas that he was in contact with about this attack. They don't believe at this point that there was anyone in the U.S. who was aware of it or who was helping him. That's always a big question, and they're going to look more into that. But so far, no indication, nothing obvious that he had help. As to why he began consuming ISIS propaganda, they don't know. Uh, we have talked to friends of his who say he recently began to show an interest in it. But why that is, whether there was some precipitating event, whether there was some crisis in his life, or something that he found offensive, we just don't know. Authorities say they haven't found that yet, Savannah. And Pete, it was interesting to hear um, the counterintelligence official John Miller say that the suspect had been interviewed at the hospital. He didn't want to characterize it. Do we have any reporting on his level of cooperation? I, I think at this point it's fair to say his level of cooperation is zero. What we're told by several officials is that he was talking to the authorities. They went in there very quickly last night after he came out of treatment for his gunshot wound uh, and that he was smug and not at all repentant uh, and, if, if anything, proud of what he had done. Now, we don't know when the charges are going to be filed. There'll be federal charges. They could be filed as early as today, but we're told that when to move on that is still under discussion. All right, Pete Williams, they also found a couple of knives in and around the car. I'm joined by NBC's Kristen Dahlgren. He's been, he's been covering the victims here, and there are eight who were killed, and we've learned of more grievous injuries as well. That's right, Savannah. So we've got eight killed. There were 12 injured. Nine of them remain in the hospital, four still in critical condition today. As for those killed, the Consulate General of Belgium says there was one woman from that country who was killed. He says that she was a mother. Uh, she had a baby. Also, five men from Argentina celebrating their 30-year anniversary of graduating high school. And then we also hear about people who are injured and, and learned this morning from this briefing that some of those injuries are quite, quite serious. Some people have been released from the hospital. Kristen, thank you. Pete Williams, thank you to you. Much more now on MSNBC, also NBCNews.com. And of course, we'll see you tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. We'll return you to regular program. Police uh, doing the areas around New York City. No, as part of, of course, as part of the investigation, we're going to go backwards in, in, his, in his history, what he's done over the last couple of months. So I can't give you an answer to that. Uh, Tina? Yeah. Hey, John, you want to talk about uh, the notes? Uh, the notes were handwritten in Arabic. Um, they had uh, symbols uh, and words. Uh, but the gist of the note was, um, that the Islamic State would endure forever. Yep. I'd like to ask Mr. Kim, uh, there is a federal death penalty for murder that is, quote, willful, deliberate, malicious, and premeditated. Do you anticipate filing a federal death penalty case uh, after this attack? Um, obviously, at this point, since we haven't uh, yet filed any criminal charges, there's not much I can say about potential charges. I can say that from the moment uh, of the attack, uh, we had uh, federal terrorism prosecutors uh, working with the NYPD, the FBI, and the Joint Terrorism Task Force and coordinating with uh, District Attorney Cy Vance's office uh, to assist in the investigation, get uh, uh, search warrants, get legal process filed, um, and to, to gather uh, the evidence and assist in the investigation for the purpose of ultimately uh, determining whether there are federal terrorism charges to be made. So. At this point, I'm not going to speculate as to what charges uh, might ultimately be brought and what the sentences might be. And a follow up to uh, John Miller. The fact that the note was written in Arabic, um, how significant is that and does it speak at all to the level of radicalization of Mr. Saipov? I don't know. Juliet? John, you want to talk about that or Bill? Uh, we're going to reconstruct that literally day by day going backwards, uh, but at this point, I'm not going to get into that um, in any detail. Can you say whether he was online looking at sites or whether he was contacting people? Or 
everything you said is a part of the investigation now. And we're peeling back through, obviously, there's a process here. Uh, what were his communications? Who were they with? Uh, what was the content? What's relevant to this? Colleen. So we're about 20 hours in now. Uh, so we're, we're going to speak to everybody involved. We're going to speak to relatives. We're going to speak to acquaintances, uh, people that he's worked with. But uh, I don't have that right now. James. Uh, Commissioner, to you and to the mayor, can you elaborate more on just how important is an officer to the protection laws? And can you detail more about the conversation that you're having? And, and from your opinion, can we have an answer to when or whether or not legal action will be taken? Yeah, OK. All right, so in, in a typical fashion of an NYPD cop, uh, he thinks what he did was not an act of heroism. He thinks it's something that, uh, why he joined the police department. I had the opportunity, opportunity to talk to Ryan last night. He was at the hospital, and uh, I don't think we could find a more humble human being. Um, they were at uh, Stuyvesant High School for an unrelated call, and somebody came in and told them that there was a vehicle accident uh, at uh, West Street and Chamber Street. So Ryan and his partner thought they were going out to handle a vehicle accident. And uh, once they got outside, they were confronted, uh, and, and they took proper action. So uh, all New Yorkers should be thankful to uh, Ryan, Ryan and his partner. They showed uh, you know, great courage. And I talk about the courage of uh, the men and women in this police department every day. And, and truly, yesterday, you saw it. And uh, here's a cop with five years on a job, 28 years old, and, and this is what he did for the city, and this is what he did for the country. So I'm really proud of him. Let me just add real quick, the, the Ryan is a hero, but he was so humble about his achievement. Uh, it was very striking. Um, I think Commissioner's right. He thought this was uh, all in a day's work and what a cop does to protect other people. But um, he deserves the accolades of the people of this city, as do his partners. To your question, uh, what was the, the potential there had he not stepped in? As you know, after the fact, we found out more. But in that situation, you don't know uh, if the shooter has multiple weapons, has a, has a bomb on him. You don't know. And God forbid that situation was even more dangerous. How many more lives, literally dozens more lives, could have been in danger? Uh, Ryan stopped that th threat immediately. Uh, we owe him a great debt of gratitude. <clears throat> well, I have to talk to him again and see what he wants to do. You know, he's, um, he's a humble guy, uh, so maybe we'll give you the opportunity, but I'm going to leave that up to him. And Jay. Commissioner, in light of the situation yesterday, the security situation for the city going forward, are you considering closing Times Square to vehicular traffic in light of this? That's too, it's premature to say that. If you go up to Times Square, you see the presence that we have there now. So in the back row. We have not yet. Uh, obviously, our condolences uh, to uh, people as Argentina and Belgium, I believe, uh, our, our condolences to those nations, to the people of those nations, to the families especially, and, and we'll do everything we can to support the families uh, in this moment. I think you know, everyone feels we're all, we're all connected at this moment. We all have to be there for each other. Yep. The second row. No, we're not going to confirm that. Uh, Tony? Uh, Commissioner, we know that the mayor alluded to this uh, earlier, but did you have, was there any indication that he did uh, fire reconnaissance in place uh, in person or the command? Yes. Um, we're not going to get into the details of the what or where, but he seems to have uh, followed the regimen uh, prescribed. All the way over on the left. Look, again, I think today is about 
a focus on this incident and all we have to do to respond to it. But I could say simply, uh, we support vetting of individuals. We support very thorough vetting, uh, not of uh, groups of people just because they belong to a group. We, we, I think this is a very crucial distinction. There should be very, very careful vetting of anyone uh, where there's an indication of a concern, but not because of their religion uh, or not because of their country of origin. Um, and uh, there's a much bigger conversation we could have about gun safety. The NYPD has always rigorously believed uh, that we need to keep guns out of this city uh, and that gun safety laws are here to protect us and protect our officers. Uh, but there'll be plenty of time to discuss these issues going forward. I want to uh, affirm the governor's point. You know, this should be a unity moment where the focus is on solving the crime and figuring out how we can move forward together, uh, not the pointing of fingers. Uh, I, the president's tweets, um, the president's tweets, I think, were not helpful. Um, I don't think they were factual. I think they tended to point fingers and politicize the situation. Uh, he was referring back to a uh, immigration policy that dealt with a lottery and blaming people who passed that. Uh, that immigration policy. Uh, his tweet wasn't even accurate as far as I'm concerned. That was a bipartisan law that was passed that had basically uh, no relevance to the facts of this situation. As I said before, you play into the hands of the terrorist to the extent you disrupt and divide and frighten people in this society. And the tone now should be the exact opposite by all officials on all levels. This is about unification. This is about solidarity. This is about normalization. Uh, this is about protection. And the last thing it's about uh, is, is politics, period. As far as the gun laws, uh, I am increasingly proud that New York State uh, passed some of the smartest gun laws in the country. Uh, the SAFE Act, uh, I think it is madness, the number of assault weapons that we have in this country. Uh, I think it endangers law enforcement. I think it costs us uh, untold numbers of deaths. Uh, and I hope one day we'll have a federal policy that actually brings sanity to the gun policy laws uh, in this country. John. We're going to go back through all of his contacts and habits, but I think this is a, an important time to say uh, this isn't about Islam. Uh, it's not about what mosque he attends. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of law-abiding Muslims in New York City who are adversely affected by things like this. And um, it's probably a good time to say we have seen in the aftermath of incidents like this uh, bias incidents, hate crimes, assaults. And uh, Bob Boyce and his hate crimes people uh, will respond to those, investigate those, and anybody behind those will be uh, prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Um, as has been said uh, here before, it is it is a time to come together and to not confuse um, this terrorist act uh, with um, any broad brush against um, uh, in a religion or a, a particular institution. Last time, okay, okay. Last time, it's been reported that police, the FBI, are asked to the suspect department in Patterson for the wife and two children. Is the wife in custody? Is she cooperating? Is she in jail? John? We're doing interviews with family members, friends, uh, associates. We're not going to be able to get into what they're saying or not saying or who's cooperating or otherwise at this point. It's just too early. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.